In this tutorial I show you how to run a latent class growth analysis LCGA with R and the FlexMix package. This is the first video in a two-part series about investigating latent subgroups for longitudinal data. The second video will be about growth mixture modeling GMM. That video will be published one week later. For instance one could use these techniques to investigate the trajectory of deviant behaviors during adolescence and what distinct patterns or what subgroups are when it comes to the development of deviant behavior. The key difference between latent class growth analysis and growth mixture modeling is, even though both identify subgroups for longitudinal data, latent class growth analysis tries to fit homogeneous subgroups, that is more or less regression lines, whereas growth mixture modeling tries to fit random effects models for the latent groups. That is, it releases the assumption that within one group the trajectory is exactly the same for all participants. So latent class growth analysis has more similarities with ordinary regression, whereas growth mixture modeling has more similarities with multi-level modeling or linear mixed effects modeling. In theory, in most cases, growth mixture modeling would be the better solution. However, unless you have huge data sets, you can quite easily run into convergence problems. So it's quite possible that you won't be able to use growth mixture modeling with your data. And then latent class growth analysis is an alternative. So let's start with the R code. The example data set is from Vardenar 2022. You can find the full reference information in the video description. And if you go to that paper in the appendix, you find an R code that can be used to generate an example data set. And I'm using this example data set. And if you go to that paper, you can copy the code, run the code and produce the same data and thereby replicate the analysis I'll be showing you. Here's our data set. It's in long format. So if you have a wide format, you have to reformat your data. That is, we have one line, not per person, but per time point. We have five time points per person. So ID one, five lines with a time, the covariate we won't be using, and then the dependent variable. And we want to investigate whether there are subgroups in our sample that are similar when it comes to the trajectory of this dependent variable Y. Before we start with the LCGA, I'd like to get a first visual impression of the data. For that I use ggplot2 and I change the ID variable into a factor variable. And with this code I draw a regression line for each person and I do this with this parameter here, group equals ID. Here we can see estimated linear trajectories for the 100 participants in this study. This is a simulated data set. In this case probably we could guess the number of latent subgroups by just looking at it. Because it looks like one subgroup here and a second subgroup here. Real life data unfortunately is more messy in most cases. So there you won't be able to just look at your data and identify the subgroups. Let's start with the latent class growth analysis. For that I use the package FlexMix. And since there is a random element involved with the estimation, I would set a seed value in order to get results that other persons could replicate. This here is the key code, the step flexmix function. Step flexmix because this function in different steps tries out different numbers of latent groups or latent components. Normally we don't know in advance how many groups there will be. So we try out different numbers of groups and then look at fit indices to decide which is the best number of groups for our data. This here is just a generic formula. Something is predicted by something. The important part is here the ID. This is the ID variable that denotes to which person a line belongs. So you will have to change that to the grouping variable or the person variable in your data frame if you use this code later on. Then the number of components. Here I'd like to try out between one and five latent subgroups. The number of repetitions. This analysis works by randomly choosing some starting values on from those starting values optimizing until it gets to a solution. The problem with this approach, it's prone to local optima. That is to solutions that can be improved by changing the parameters just a little bit, but that are nevertheless not the overall optimal solutions. For that reason, one uses different starting values with the hope that at least for one of those starting values, you will get the global optimal solution. Here we have a very simple model with just time as predictor. So here we could get away with a rather low number of starting values of 100. If you have more complex models, I definitely would increase this number. 
to increase the chance that you really get the best possible solution. Then the model definition, here is the name of the function that is to be fitted, GLM fix, GLM general linear model, that is regression. Here we predict our dependent variable with a predictor time and with wall fix we specify that the error variance should be the same in all latent groups. Then the name of the data frame and the control parameter. This is a list of possible tuning parameters for the optimization. Important is this one because this implies that it tries out at most 500 steps to get to an optimal result. If later on in your analysis you get non-convergence for your model, then it's a possibility to increase this number. Hopefully for higher number of iteration, finally you will have a model that converges, but not always, unfortunately. Let's run this. It's rather fast, especially compared to growth mixture modeling, which can take a very long time, but here normally just a couple of seconds. The program tries out five different numbers of latent variables and for each of those numbers 100 repetitions, so 500 different analyses are calculated. I cut to the time point where it was finished. Now let's compare the model fit results for the five different numbers of clusters. Here we see the number of clusters. Converged was true for all of them. That's good, so we can work with the results. Otherwise we would have to increase the number of iterations because a result without convergence we couldn't really interpret. Here are different fit measures. For a mixture model I would choose BIC or ICL. And if I want to know the correct number of subgroups, I think the best one is ICL. And a low value is good. Here we can see the lowest value is for four clusters. But we can also see that from two clusters to four clusters, the change isn't really that big. And there's one important thing to keep in mind. Latent class growth analysis has the tendency to identify too many clusters, often by splitting up one latent group into two different but quite similar groups. For that reason, looking at these results where after cluster 2 the improvement was only marginal, I'm not sure whether I would definitely go with a four cluster solution. So for the rest of this tutorial we'll be looking at two solutions. The two cluster solution and the four cluster solution. First let's extract the specific model objects for those two solutions with the get model function. And then let's look at the solutions. First the two cluster solution. This is the key part. The prior is not that interesting. The size can easily be misleading because here it's not the size of the clusters when it comes to the persons, but when it comes to the observations. We had five observations per person, so here we actually have 50 persons in the first cluster and 50 persons in the second cluster. If you don't want to calculate that by head, you could use this line, so 50 in both clusters. However, that calculation only works if all persons have the same number of measurement occasions. This column here, posterior probability larger than zero, shows us how many, in this case, time points are there for persons that have a non-zero probability of being assigned to that cluster. Again, dividing that by five, we see that there are only three persons with a posterior probability of higher than zero for group one that are not assigned to that group. And that's a very good classification. The ratio is those grouped into the cluster divided by those with a non-zero probability of being grouped into that cluster. And here high values are good and these are extremely high values. You probably won't find in an empirical data set. Next we would like to understand what those clusters are with the parameters function. Here are the two clusters. For the first cluster we have an intercept of 9.95 and a slope of 0.26. And for the second cluster we have an intercept of 10.4 and a slope of 1.7. So we have a slightly higher intercept but we have a much higher slope in the second group. The sigma is the estimate for the error variance, which we have set to be equal in both groups. Now to the plot function. With that we get a so-called rutogram. That's a plot of all cases, or in this case time points, with a posterior probability that is non-zero. It's something similar to histogram, but on the y-axis the square root instead of the normal frequency. And here we can see those with a non-zero probability either have extremely high probability to cl be clustered in a certain group or an extremely low probability. This looks very good and you won't be seeing something like this with real data. Because here we have no cases that are not clearly assigned to one of the two groups. Now let's look at the same 
for the four cluster solution, that is four latent groups with four different trajectories over time. Here we have the group sizes. Again, you would have to divide them by five. One group with 18 participants, one group with 32, one group with 26, and one group with 24 participants. When we look here at the ratios, we can see that it doesn't look as nice as before. Here we can see the parameter estimates for the regressions in the four different latent groups. We can see those two here are quite similar, similar intercept and similar slope. And here th those two have a similar intercept and a somewhat similar slope. Then let's look at the rutograms. And those rutograms show that probably the four component solutions doesn't make that much sense because we have a huge amount of cases here in the middle that can't be clearly assigned to one of the components or one of the clusters. So the rutograms clearly favor the two cluster solution compared to the four cluster solution. Those were summary statistics. Now let's look at the specific cases. Let's look at the probabilities for each case, or more precisely for each observation, with which it was assigned to a certain cluster. Because it's more instructive here in this case, let's look at the four cluster solution. This is on the level of the measurement occasions. Five lines belong to one person. In the first five lines, each line is the same. And the first column is the probability of being assigned to the first cluster, being assigned to the second cluster, to the third cluster, and to the fourth cluster. In this example, the probability of being assigned to the fourth cluster is 0 0.9977, almost one. So that's a case that was quite clearly assigned to a specific cluster. But that's not always the case. If we look at this case here, probability of 74% for cluster 3 and 26% for cluster 4. And that will be a case that would be shown in the rutogram somewhere in the middle. If we just want to know what's the cluster with the highest probability, then we can use the clusters function. Again, showing it here for the four cluster solution. So the first observation here with five different time points was assigned to cluster 4, the second to cluster 3, and so on. This is one of the key parts we can get from such a model. Earlier we looked at the parameter estimates. We can also get test results. Here for the two cluster solution, the first cluster with the estimates we saw earlier, but now also with standard errors, test statistic and p-values. And of course we could do the same for the four cluster solution. What's interesting is to add the clusters we got from our model to the data, because then we can analyze our data based on those latent clusters. For that, I use a new data frame and add the clusters I extract from the model as a factor variable to this data frame. Here we have our normal data frame we saw earlier, but now, in addition to that, we get the cluster that person is assigned to. The same for four cluster solution. Here the first person with those five lines was assigned to cluster four. The first thing we can do with that, we can plot the cluster membership. This is more or less the same code from above, but here I added color equals cluster. So I have one regression line for each person, but the color will show us to which cluster this person was assigned by the algorithm. And here we can see a quite clear two cluster solution. Doing the same for the four clusters. And here we see what happened, how those four clusters came into place. The algorithm just had split in the middle the two large clusters into two. So for me, this does not look as convincing as the two cluster solution. So in this case, I definitely would use the two cluster solution, even if the four cluster solution had a marginal better fit index. Where to go from here? The next possible step is investigating the cluster results. So using this data frame with the addition of the clusters. In this example, we had no meaningful covariates. But in real life data, you will have covariates. Things like age, gender, all kinds of sociodemographic information, and maybe other constructs, maybe outcome variables. And for instance, now you could run a logistic regression to predict the cluster membership. Here with two clusters, a binary logistic regression, with more than two clusters, a multinomial logistic regression. And you could try to predict the cluster membership, for instance, based on age, gender, income, or things like that to see what explains the cluster membership, because that's the really interesting part. Not only what different developments over time do you have, but what explains what kind of development a person will have, to which group they will belong. And if you have outcome variables in your data set, then you could use the clusters as predictors. That is, run a t-test or an ANOVA based on the cluster membership. If you'd like to get more information about how to report models like this, I recommend an article by Schott et al. from 2017. You will find the full information in the video description.
and you can find the full R code for this tutorial on a companion webpage. Link is also in the video description. And I strongly recommend also watching my tutorial about growth mixture modeling. As soon as that is published, I will post a link to the video description as well. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.